Today's sermon is entitled, Walking Through Walls. My name is Reverend Derek Gelder, and I'm senior pastor at McKees Mills Baptist Church. I want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I love this, this phrase in Psalms. It says, with your help, I can advance against the truth. With my God, I can scale a wall. Psalms 18, 29. That is beautiful. We're going to find out exactly what King David actually meant by this phrase, and hopefully by the end of it, we're going to take this phrase and apply it to our lives. What our minds know as sweet doctrine, our hearts have yet to be fully experienced. Even though we know that we are not to worry about our lives, that we're not supposed to worry about the clothes that we're going to wear, or worry about what we're going to eat, or what we're going to drink, or how we're going to make enough money to survive, most Christians are consumed with the unending belief that dangers are coming around every single corner and it's going to come tomorrow. You ever feel that way? You ever look at the news and watch it and you see all the bad things that are happening in the world and you wonder, when are these things going to come at me? Or do you ever wonder to yourself, if you have a couple bad days, is it always going to be like that? Some people certainly do. Fear of the unknown is something somewhat understandable, I think, because we have memories. We have memories of pain and anguish, of past trials and tribulations. And we understand that through these memories that, yes, bad things happen to good people. God says that in his holy word. He says, I will allow the rain, or I'll cause the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. I will allow both good and bad things happen to Everyone all across this world. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. The burdens come in so many forms. The burdens that we go through, the ones that we think about, the ones that we're always got inside of our mind and saying, you know what, something really bad is coming. Those kind of burdens are always going through our mind. And they come in so many different ways. And we know this from past history. They come from attacks from enemies. Burdens come from financial insolvency. Burdens come from marital disagreements. Burdens come from the death of loved ones. Burdens certainly come from physical diseases. But I think the most crucial and the most debilitating of all burden that any Christian faced is Satan. Satan is going to attack us because we are Christians. He's going to try to take us down. He's going to try to keep us from having hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and having faith in him. And he's going to try to get us to be silent and absolutely miserable in front of this world. We are Christians. We are born again believers. We're supposed to have great hope. We're supposed to have peace. We're supposed to be happy. And we certainly should be. And Satan will do whatever he can to pull us down from showing the world our joy. Christians face constant attacks from the devil because he wants to make sure that we don't show that joy. The yoke of these burdens that we feel seems insurmountable. It almost seems like it's a wall in front of us that forever will keep us stuck in our tribulations and will forever keep us in fear and despair. This is where Satan would like to have us. If you're feeling that way, if you're feeling like there is a wall in front of you, if you're feeling like this world is really not a great place to be in right now, if you're feeling a little bit scared about the unknown future, this sermon is for you, definitely. Because King David said, with your help, God, I can advance against a troop, and with my God, I can scale a wall. Let's find out what he meant by that. But first, let's start off. Conquering one troop. Enemies. I like to think most people don't want to have an enemy. I certainly don't. Nobody goes out, I don't think, looking for enemies or trying to stir up people and make them to be enemies. Most don't want them, yet they spring up like bad weeds in a garden. Have you ever planted a garden? I certainly have, and it's not a whole lot of fun sometimes when after you plant your garden and you get all the nice rows that are made and they're semi-straight anyway, and you're looking at them and you got all your seeds in there and you start to see some plants come up, and lo and behold, and you get really upset about it sometimes, there's the weeds. They seem to grow far faster than the plants. And sometimes they're so big, it's awful hard to get rid of them, isn't it? And it almost seems like, ultimately, that our enemies spring up like that. They're absolutely everywhere. Even though we're created in the image of God, each one of us has unique personalities. I'm going to talk about how we get our enemies now. 
Here's how it usually happens. I think our identities are forged in experiences. That's part of how our identities are formed. But they're formed in other ways too as well. I got thinking about our, our personality, certainly formed by our family. Certain families are going to produce certain kind of personalities and other families are going to influence their children and their grandchildren and their relatives in a different way. Certainly our culture in which we are brought up in. If we're brought up in Canada or for U.S. or Japan or Mexico or Russia, certainly that's going to have a profound impact upon our personality. Certainly the religion of which we believe in, that's going to have an effect upon us. Our workplace, oh my goodness, we spend eight hours a day at least in our workplace. That's going to have an effect on how we turn out. Our social status, whether we are the popular person or whether we're not so popular. And then certainly our peer group. In other words, the people that are around us that tell us, here's how you should be to be cool. Uh, certainly they have an effect on our personality too as well. While the world says that uniqueness is to be tolerated and celebrated, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Practically, that's not true. Difference often results in people being repulsed with each other. In other words, because of all these different things or these different factors that go into forming my personality that ends up being unique, for some groups of people on the face of this earth, they're going to like me. They're going to like my personality. I'm going to get along with a lot of people. But for other people, I'm going to rub them the wrong way and it's going to be very hard to get along with them, especially if I, uh, I wrong them in any way, shape, or form. Having enemies is inevitable, especially if one is a Christian because the light that shines in us exposes the evil deeds of others and testifies that they're not right with God. John 3, 20. John 15, uh, 18 to 25. When people revolt against us, who can do us really serious harm, either physical, financial, spiritual, or psychological harm, terror and desperation often floods into our souls. You know, it's strange why some people who end up being our enemies, who really can't do us a whole lot of harm, we feel they can, and as a result of that, we're absolutely petrified of them. Strange how that happens, isn't it? Since we've not been given a spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1.7, the psalmist rightly reminds us that we are to have faith, that God can help us to advance against the one troop that is seeking our demise. Now, that's a hard expression to understand. What does King David mean when he says, you know what, I can stand with God's help against one troop. Well, you know what, I could probably on my own stand against one troop anyway. Certainly David could have. He was a ferocious fighter. So what did he mean when he said one troop? I'm going to tell you a story. This story is about Hezekiah and the king of Assyria. When the king of Assyria came in and he went to attack King Hezekiah, what happened? Let me tell you the story. Even though Hezekiah did exactly what was right in God's sight, it says that he was faithful, he tore down the Asherah poles, he went and cleansed the temple, he went and got the people of, of uh, Jerusalem to worship God in the way they should. He was a man after God's heart, ultimately. He tried to do what was right in God's sight. And God said, you know what? You are being faithful, Hezekiah. Even though that is the case, we know as Christians, even though if you serve God faithfully, that doesn't mean difficult times won't come. They certainly do. This is true about Hezekiah. Hezekiah did what was right. He did what was faithful before the Lord God. 2 Chronicles 31.20 we are told that a vastly more powerful king of Assyria, this guy named Sennacherib, he invaded and he laid siege on the fortified cities of Judah. Okay, that's a problem. Despite blocking the streams, and that's the first thing he did. So here's what Hezekiah decided to do. He said, first, I'm going to take all the streams in my kingdom. I'm going to block them all up. I'm going to get rid of as much water as I can or access to the water outside of my fortified city that I'm sitting in. I don't want the army to drink my water, in other words. If they want some water, they can go find it themselves somewhere else. That's the first thing he did. You know, the second thing that he did, he decided that he would make repairs. He went and looked at the wall that was all around this fortified city, and he said, I'm going to make repairs to this wall. It's been damaged in the past. I'm going to make sure it's very secured. But then he said, you know what? I'm not quite done with that. I'm going to build another wall outside of the first one and make it even more difficult for my enemy to come in and attack me. So he did that too as well. He made a whole bunch of weapons, it says, and a whole bunch of shields. 
And he said, all right, I've gotten as ready as I possibly can. And even though he took every step that he could, Hezekiah found out that his men really needed him. His men needed reassurance. Even though they understood that God was there, they still wanted to know. Hezekiah, can we win? Can we survive this? Hezekiah, what's going to happen to us? Jerusalem military officers needed to have words of hope from their king because, Hezekiah, because Assyria had a vast and a superior army. You can see it in the picture up here. Just a massive army. They were no match. None. Zero. I want to make that very, very specific. They had no chance of survival. None. This vast army had gone through 46 fortified cities of Judah, decimated them all, not just them, but a whole bunch of other nations around the area. And here they were outside of Jerusalem getting ready to attack. There was no chance that Hezekiah, based on human might and power, could ever hold them back, period. Hezekiah's military army was scared for very good reasons. First, according to the Assyrian annals, um, this guy, this Assyrian king, swept through all of Judah and took out the 46 towns of Judah and took out 200,000 of them captive. Now, that would make you just a little bit nervous and a little bit scared. You know what? That's just a little bit off. And second, while he was attacking Lachesh, this king of Assyria, he goes to the officials and he tells Hezekiah, the officials come up to Hezekiah and tell him and all the people, stop having confidence in your God. What are you doing? And of course, they're saying, look, our God's going to save us. Our God of Jerusalem, the God of Israel. He's a great God. He saved us before. He's going to do it again. And of course, these officers are yelling at them in Hebrew in their own language, and saying, whoa, it's not going to happen the way you think it is. We've come across nation after nation, and every one of them has had their own gods, and every one of them has said the same thing, our gods will save us, and every single time we've decimated them, and it was without any effort, hardly at all. And of course, this made them scared. In other words, the officer was saying, it's very foolish to believe in a God you cannot see because that God's not going to help you. Well, the children of Israel got scared with those comments. Even though Hezekiah had paid tribute to the Assyrian king earlier, 2 Kings 18, 14, this foreigner was now outside their walls and he was crying out threats in Hebrew instilling fear in the hearts of those stationed on the wall. And they were frightened because he kept saying the same thing. You know what? If you surrender, you'll live. But if you fight, you will die. Of course, they were scared, really scared. I found this picture on the internet. I don't know who it is of, but that's not relevant. Uh, scared. That guy looks like he's petrified. I'm not sure what he's looking at, but you can see the fear in his eyes. Imagine for a moment that you're on the wall of Jerusalem that fateful night. As you look around the vast Assyrian army, you know that you're supposed to be brave and confident in the Lord, but yet you find yourself trembling and the utmost fear. You reason to yourself that is understandable that you feel this kind of fear. You just spent several days wondering, and you're still wondering, what happened to my friends? What happened to my relatives? What happened to my colleagues that were in those 46 fortified cities of Judah that just got conquered? Where are they now? Have they been taken captive? Are they dead? Where are they? What's happening to them? You're really scared. Are they dead? Are they alive? What's gone on? And as you look out again at this vast army, your heart begins to break because you realize that you're feeling overwhelmed. You might lose everything. You know what? Right now, the stock market has done a lot of funny things. It's gone down a lot of points just recently. It's lost approximately 30% of its value. It fluctuates back and forth, but it's still down. And I'm sure a lot of people are scared. I'm going to lose some money. And some people have, and I feel for them. I certainly do. But here's the thing, this fellow, here you are, you're standing on the wall, and you see this vast army, and they're telling you, we're coming, and we're here right now. We're going to destroy you, and we're going to take you captive. Best case scenario, you're going to lose everything. You're going to spend your retirement years as a slave to our nation. At the very best scenario, 
And what makes you even more disturbed is the possibility that maybe when this army attacks, that maybe one of your children or your wife might be killed and you wonder, how will I ever live with such a horror? And you wonder, facing Assyria, you think, aren't your fears more than of a reality check than a fantasy of your imagination? You conclude that it's inevitable. Jerusalem, like all the other fortified cities and the other nations of Syria attacked, is about to fall. And we're going, at best case scenario, to a foreign land as a slave. You can only imagine how desperate and how sad and how scared you would feel on that wall. Even though Jerusalem was powerless to resist such a formidable enemy, you know what? God showed up. You know what? Assyria threatened God's people. It represented nothing more to God than a mere troop. God looked at this vast army that was huge and Jerusalem couldn't handle them. King Hezekiah cried out and the prophet Isaiah cried out, Lord, help us. We're good as dead. We're not going to survive. We're going to go into captivity. Help us, Lord. The reality is God looked upon this Assyrian army and said, you're just one troop. You're just like a single fighting man to me. You're nothing. I'm omnipotent. Sometimes we forget that. When we go through trials and tribulations and difficulties in life, sometimes we forget that God is in charge and he's in control and he is sovereign. And we forget. And that's so unfortunate. Scripture states that King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah cried out unto the Lord. And God sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men, all the commanders, all the officers of this Assyrian army that were threatening him. Oh my goodness, God showed up. And he proved, just like he did for David, he proved this army, even though it was vast, even though it was superior, was just like a single troop. And it's almost like God took his finger and just ping, and they were gone. Just like that. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is a powerful God. Wow. In today's passage, King David had a similar experience for God easily delivered him from the hands of King Saul and all of his armies. Remember the story. King Saul is chasing David all over the countryside. He's got this great big army. He's in charge of this huge kingdom. Israel. David, he's not king yet. He's got a few men with him, but very few. And he's running for his life because King Saul wants him dead. And God delivered him from King Saul. And it would be King Saul who would kill himself by his own hand. He would go to the grave. And King David, well, he would be King David at that point. He became king. And that's amazing. God is good. Moses cried out to God. And he drowned the Egyptian army into the sea. Exodus 14. Even the might and the power of all of Rome and the Jewish Sanhedrin, even though they got Jesus on the cross, they could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. Jesus Christ rose from the dead with the keys of hell in his hand and said, I am victor, as he always was. Satan was no match. As powerful as he is, as strong as he is, Satan was no match for the Son of God himself. No match. When it comes to physical ailments, remember, Jesus opened the ears of the deaf. He caused the blind to see. He healed the diseases of the people and even raised people from the dead. And doing so, he proved disease is just one troop against God. For with a single command, diseases obey him. They disappear. They move away. They get annihilated with one command. From our God. Our God. No enemy. No financial difficulty. No marital disagreement. No virus and no diseases. Anything but a mere troop to Christ who is sovereign over all things seen and unseen. Colossians 1.16 Jesus truly does good to those who love him and cry out in faith, not fear. Lord, help me. They will be delivered. They will be. Let's talk about scaling the wall. Now that we understand a little bit more about what David meant by, you know what, you helped me handle that one troop. 
In other words, God decimates the one troop. No matter how big it is in our eyes, it's nothing to God. Let's look at the second part. David says, you know what? You help me scale the wall. I got thinking about that. My goodness, I love the phrase scale the wall, but what does it mean? What is David talking about? The most difficult burden that Christians face, I think, is a constant attack on our holiness by the spiritual forces of evil of this dark world. Ephesians 6.2. Apostle Peter tells us to be alert and of sober mind for our enemy, the devil. He roars around like a, a lion. He wants to devour us. He wants to destroy our witness to the world. So he's going to make our lives as difficult as he possibly can. So maybe, possibly we'll lose faith and start complaining about our situation rather than saying, our God's awesome. He's got this. He's really got this. The devil was created as an angel of light. He was sealed with perfection. He was filled with wisdom and beauty, Ezekiel 28, 12. He is a master deceiver. Of those, ultimately, of, of whose attacks I think are ferocious, and his strength is unparalleled, we cannot handle him. Knowing the evil desires of our heart, James 1, 14, and how easily our minds succumb to fear, he raises his bow and he constantly shoots his fiery darts at us, Ephesians 6.16, he fire, fires those darts, and I think there's two kinds. One is temptation to get us to sin against God, and the second one is just fear. He fires fear at us. He makes us feel like the thing, everything is hopeless. He makes us feel like we shouldn't trust in our Lord and our God. Instead, we should just feel the whole world is against us, or the whole world's coming to an end. He attacks our future in our minds and shows us the worst possible scenarios so that we might lose hope. So powerful are his deceptions that scripture states that he took humanity captives as his slaves, powerless to ever escape, Romans 6.20. Sin created an impenetrable wall between us and a holy God that by human effort alone it cannot be scaled or torn down. That's true. That's really true. Satan makes sure the wall that he places in front of us called sin, we can't get it down. We can't get around it. We can't stop sinning. Remember what Paul said? Why is it all the things I know I ought to do, I don't do? And why is it all the things I know I shouldn't do, all those sins that God tells me about, those are the things I do all the time? And he cries out, Lord, God, help me. Help me. I'm a wretched man. Help me. Because without you, I'll never stop sinning. But Jesus Christ died on the cross. And when he did, he broke the power of sin over us. And we are free. We are free. When our own strength, we cannot scale the walls of Satan's attack. We certainly can. With Jesus, our comforter, and the spirit of truth as our guide, we are untouchable. We are firmly secured in an eternal foundation of victory over sin and death. And that is so true. When Jesus Christ died on the cross to atone for humanity, he leaped over the walls of sin that was imprisoning us and he stood there with the keys of hell in his hands and he said, forever I have secured their right and their place and their freedom inside of God's kingdom. They will be my children if they believe in me. And nobody will take them from my hand. Nobody will snatch them from me. They will be my children. I will be their God and they will be my people. Oh my goodness, if that doesn't bring joy to your heart. From Apostle Paul, we learn that the true battleground for a Christian is in the mind. For it is there that one learns that the walls Satan puts in our lives, they're not impenetrable at all. They're not really. If we believe in Jesus Christ, if we give him our allegiance, then we can leap over any wall, we can break any chain that Satan puts in front of us. Because Jesus has already done that on the cross and secured our freedom. He certainly has. In conclusion, David says this. I want to go back to the first verse. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Psalms 18.29 May our minds come to know what this phrase truly means. It is truly sweet doctrine in our ears, especially living in this fallen world. But more importantly, may our hearts fully experience this to be true. May we really believe it's true in practice. 
For this to happen, one must have faith and give one's allegiance to Jesus. We've got to believe that he secured our victory over the prince of this world. There will always be a new enemy. There will always be financial difficulties. There will always be marital issues. There will always be another virus or another disease lurking around every single corner to fill our hearts with fear if we allow it. When this happens, may we not see the yoke of these fiery darts of Satan as insurmountable, but may we see it as a single troop, a puny, tiny little wall that Christ can easily, with the flick of his finger or a single word, absolutely decimate and destroy. May we see it that way. Let us put our faith into practice. Let us put it into practice. Here's the thing. I know that the coronavirus, COVID-19, has placed incredible fear in many people's hearts. I've talked to both non-Christians and Christians, and I find the response is roughly about the same. It is the unknown that really bothers an awful lot of people. Much while there is, is very little that is known about this disease and this virus, which really is why people have got so much fear, even Christians, what we do not know is true, and it does bother us to a certain extent, but what we do know should give us great comfort and great support. Our God who sent His Son to die on the cross to break the bondage of sin is always and will always be omnipotent and in charge. Period. Surely we as Christians believe that. Surely we as Christians are not like the world and we're not scared and we're not frightened and we're not feeling like the world's about to end or everyone's going to be decimated. Surely we have hope in our Lord Jesus Christ that He will always do good to those who love Him. Surely we have that in our hearts. Let us take every precaution to be safe. Absolutely. Let's make sure we're safe. Let's make sure we wash our hands frequently. Let's make sure we don't go into huge public arenas or areas. Let's make sure we do everything we can to be good stewards of the body and the life that God has given us. But at the same time, let us not cower in our homes except to be good stewards, but let's not do it because we want to have fear, because we're too scared to go out the door. Let's not do it for that reason. Let's stand up and tell the world, this disease, because it's unknown, because we know very little about it, and because it looks like it's, it's partially deadly, but we don't know to what extent, let's tell this whole world, this disease represents what one mere troop to God. And the very second that God says, enough is enough, you will move no more on my earth. You will now leave. It will be annihilated at that very moment and gone. Let's tell the world we have faith. Let's show them that we have faith in a moment of crisis. Let's point them to our God and say, our God. Let me tell you a few stories of the times he saved us in the past. And he will save us again. So you're feeling a little bit scared about this virus. I certainly understand. But don't let it overwhelm you. Don't let it rob you of your future. Don't let it get you so in a frenzy that you forget to live and you forget to have faith that Jesus has this virus in control in his hand. And the moment he says, you will be no more, the virus will be no more. Praise be to God that our God is an awesome and amazing God. And praise be he's in charge. Praise be to God. Amen and amen.